But when we talk about Siratul Mustaqim, we're talking about a dynamic that has certain aspects to it that don't change. Qada qat'iyat. salah. Establish the prayer. That's fixed. Nobody's going to change that. When I became Muslim, my mother said, baby, why don't you pray Juma on Sunday? That way we can all be together. There's maslaha. I said, ya mama, la ishtihad bi wujudin nas, ya mama. I said to her, we can't change that. That's something that doesn't change. That's something that the prophet, why don't you, I remember my uncle, why don't you fast at night, son? It'd be better for you, you could fast at night. All of us are struggling for acceptance. And one of the hardest things to achieve is spiritual authenticity. When you're dealing with people like Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hutchins, the late Christopher Hutchins, and you're dealing with people like Bill Maher and these people who are constantly assaulting you, and then you come to a community where you might not culturally feel connected, the need and the atash for authenticity becomes really strong. And the easy way to do that is to say, my group is right, your group is wrong. And to misuse text from Quran and Sunnah. We are still prepubescent community in America. We got a long ways to go, man. And when I see people using the hadith about the 73 sex, 72 and 73, so that means Adam's sin is off the path. Why did number 74, man? I asked him, really, are you aware of how the scholars use that text? How they took the text of my ummah divided into 72, 73, the Christians and Jews and so on. This text, Rahu Tirmidhi wa Ibn Majah wa Ahmed wa Nasa'i. Bi asanid fiha ma fiha min maqad. But then you read what the scholars said about that hadith. First of all, the majority said this hadith is weak. The hadith is weak. Imam Ibn Hajr, he considered it sound. Imam Ibn Taymiyyah considered it sound. As did a shatibi and i'tisam. But even those scholars who considered it authentic, they said that it is not allowed to label anyone a number. In fact, Ash-Shatibi qala kalam jamil jiddan. Ash-Shatibi said, in fact, the groups who committed the most fitna on the ummah were not those who were deemed as being one of the 70, but it was usually the one that thought it was the right group. Because self-righteousness is a fitna. Self-righteousness is a ghurur. But people will use that text to split us and say, you're not on Siratul Mustaqim. Why? You pray 8, we pray 20. Are you crazy? So let's, as we conclude, because I don't want to take a lot of your time, break it down real quick. That in Islam, we have two types of texts. The Quran and Sunnah, only two types of texts. Number one is called a nas Number two is called a zahir Remember that. Zahir in Urdu. Asif ya Mawlana. Samihni. And this is important. And that's why wherever I live, I teach usul al-fiqh. Because man laysa, man kan yata'alam al-usul, fa ma anduhu usul. Whoever hasn't studied that should not really get off into Islamic activism. Or if they do, they shouldn't talk too much. Because they're going to make, as Imam Amr bin Abdullah said, afsar akthar mimma yuslih. They will cre create more trouble than good. So we have two types of texts. Identified by our scholars from the earliest ages. One is called a nas. The word nas means to be high. They used to call, you know, in Pakistan, in, in Malaysia, I had to do it. You ain't seen the pictures. When I married my wife, they made me get up on that throne, you know, watch the throne. And, and I remember I was up there and I was like, man, this is high, man, because I'm a tall dude. And this throne is, and they call that nasul aris. It's called nas because it's high. So it's used, watch how this is going to come back to haunt you. It's used as a comparison, just like Surat al Mustaqim. You call a text which is so explicit and so clear, nas. So that text is like nas. Just like Islam is like a straight path. The same thing as isti'ara. What that means is a text as uh, one of our mashaykh, he said, ma la yahtamilu ta'wil. A text that doesn't allow for interpretation. Allah says, for example, and you guys okay? Everybody all right? In Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, ثَلَاثَةً فِي الْحَجِّ وَسَبَعَةٍ إِذَا رَجَعْتُمْ That a person should fast three days in hajj if they violated certain things. 
and seven when they get back. Tilka asharatun kamila. He says, that's ten. Three and seven equals what? So that's a nas. It's so explicit. Three and seven is ten. No one's going to say, well, I think, you know, if we can deconstruct ten according to Maslow's understanding of hermeneutics, you know, seven and three actually could be like what? Like, and then we all get into this weird, stupid, postmodern garbage. La mawlana. Had a nas, ya mawlana. Oh, scoot. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, aqimu salah. Establish salah. It's clear. We can say, well, you know, I don't know, because like Akimu could be, you know, with calf and, you know, Yalla mashal hala mama. Or someone could say, you know, for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know, Atimul Hajjah, complete the Hajj. Hajj is Hajj. Hadha nas. Allah says, Wa aburullah wa la tushiku bihi shay'a. I worship Allah. Don't make shirk. Hadha nas. And the Quran and Sunnah has these kind of texts where the scholars didn't debate about their meaning. In fact, Al-Qarafi said, you should never attribute these, attribute these texts to any madhab. Because the madhab is, an, is a term which immediately means a scholar had to engage an understanding. So he said, if you said, according to Malik, you should pray five times a day, la, that's wrong. According to Allah, you should pray five times a day. According to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you should pray five times a day. And that takes us into the next type of text, al-Zahir. Al-Zahir is a text which allows the scholars to debate and argue about it because it's not conclusive. It's not nas. It doesn't stick out. For example, Allah says, فِطَعَامُ sitina, miskina. Allah says, let them feed 60 poor people. What does miskin mean? No, not if you're Abu Hanifa, it doesn't. Miskin in Arabic has three or four meanings. One is like a pound, 60 pounds. Another meaning of miskin is a poor person. So you find the majority of scholars said, it'amu sitina miskin means to feed 60 poor people. Abu Hanifa said, not according to us up here in Kufa, miskin means 60 pounds of weight, not people. That's called zahir. The scholars are going to differ. Watch how beautiful it gets. And I know you're tired, but we have to raise the discourse. And one of the things I love about Imam Majid M&M is that M&M don't play, yo. Right? He raises the discourse. You have a, a, a full functional madrasa in your community. Take advantage of that, man. So we find that the scholars differ over who should pray in the masjid. The Hanbali say, if a man lives close to the masjid, he has to go to pray in the masjid. Sadat al-Maliki, the Malikis, the Shafis, and the Hanafis, they say, no, it's mu'akkada, sunnah mu'akkada. But if he does it constantly, it's a problem. If he fails to go constantly to the masjid, that becomes a problem. Now, what's interesting in here, pay attention, is the Hanbali's evidence is that the Prophet said, I wish I could have wood and do what? We all know the hadith. I wish it, with this hadith makes people who love, you know, human rights flip out. Because it totally violates the Geneva Convention. And let me explain that before you write it down, sir. Or record it. But what's the hadith about, I wish I could collect what and do what? For people who don't come to the masjid and pray. I wish I could what? Collect firewood and what? And burn down people's cribs. Who don't come to the masjid. So the Hanbali say, Here's this hadith. The Prophet said if he could grab, collect khashab together and burn down people's homes, it's on like popcorn on Thursday night, man. What do you think about that, Malikis? And the Malikis, being the ultimate ballers that they are, <clears throat> responded. But this is cool. What hadith do you think they used to respond? The same hadith. They said, well, our proof is that he didn't do it. And we have an axiom that says if the prophet threatened something and never acted on it, then it was only to instill a sense of importance, not reality. Here's two divergent opinions based on what? The same text. Now, if that's the case, and this happened with the Sahaba, this happened and we don't have much time. One day we'll come back and do a course in Usul al-Fiqh, inshallah. And you have one of the greatest scholars in American Usul al-Fiqh, Imam Majid, here, right now, amongst you. Take advantage of that opportunity. Sheikh Majid is like a buffet that's just waiting to be devoured. 
Real talk. And that's the same thing as Salatul Mustaqim. I did it on purpose, by the way. I could have said, you have a buffet here. That would have been the same usage. And he's someone that you should have adab with. Don't. One of the biggest fitness I've seen in American communities is they take the giants in front of them for granted. They don't have proper adab with him. You know the restroom in front of his office? Today I felt like Bear Grylls and Survival Man trying to make it through that restroom. Wallahi, man. It's like that new space movie where they land and they all die with the Snow White Lady. Right? Man, that's your imam's restroom, yo. Have some adab. First of all, there's massive punishment for the person who does not know how to use the potty properly. Okay, hello. And secondly, this is the restroom of your imam, B. Like, there should be, like, hayat, man. I mean, it was, it was, it was jacked up today. I'm not going to lie. It was like survival series. I pulled out the flint, the flint and the compass. I was like, I'm here in Imam Majid's restroom. I have 24 hours to live. Right? And he wasn't here, so it wasn't him. Don't even try to go that way. And I saw some kid walk out with the Wu-Tang Clan shirt. I don't know what they was wearing. You know, protect your neck. Protect the Tahara. Real talk. That's basic adab with your sheikh. Basic adab with your ulama in front of you. Because you can't get knowledge being an arrogant fool. You can't be knowledge having a hard heart. Oh, this sheikh, I read on pal talk. You know, I was on some, you know, disjointed, jacked up people net talk show. And they were blasting. Today we're going to talk about the matter of Suhaib Web. What is wrong with these people? The matter of Majid. Talk about the matter of your hellfire, man. So real talk. So we have the same text in two different opinions. But guess what? The Hanbalis don't play. The Hanbalis responded. So oh yeah, we got another text. That there is no prayer for the neighbor of the mosque except in the mosque. Hmm. The Malikis, the Shafis, and the Hanafis said, oh yeah? Well, guess what? There's no prayer at the neighbor for the mosque except in the mosque. Huh, same text. And this debate continues right down the line. They use the same text over and over and over and over again. Now that takes us to a third component of Salat al-Mustaqim, and that is when there's no text. We establish that there are two different types of texts, right? The text we don't play. Then there's a text we argue about it. So for example, to wear niqab or hijab. Why are women busy about that? We should welcome hijabis and niqabis equally. And just as we like to have sisters on stage with makeup, you know, may Allah help them realize that their foundation is here and not here. And, and they're out there rocking it. And we present that to the people. See, we're modern, alhamdulillah, you know. We should equally have a niqabi who's articulate, intelligent, and understand what it means to be massive imam, sw imam swagger in America on the mic because she's equally part of our community. And we should not call them ninjabs. You're talking about the dress of your mothers. The wives of the prophet were wearing niqab. But look at the discussion around niqab. The majority of fuqaha said it's not far. The Hanbali said it's far. What's the proof? They all say the hadith of Abbas, his son, his brother, Fadil. When the prophet saw him on hajj and a woman came and he turned away from her. They say, he turned away from her because the aura of the woman is her face. That's the Hanbali position. Bam, respected. You right here. You ask the other three, they said, although he turned away from her face, the prophet did not order her to cover. They used the same evidence for two different positions. That's total crack right there without the bad side effects. I mean, that's just incredible. And you see the plurality. And not to belittle crack, it's a horrible thing. And those of us who came from the 80s, we're lucky they wouldn't have all kind of cognitive issues because of it, right? Our P's are not B's and stuff. But that's a real problem in our community, by the way. But the same text is used for two different opinions. Now, that takes us into the third type of text, and that's where it's a blessing to have someone like Imam Majid here, because the Suyuti said in Ashba' wa Nadair that it is fard, on every community to have a mufti in their city. Because the job of the mufti is to, are you guys okay? I know it's deep, but it's important. Imam Abu Amr ibn Salah al-Shafi'i said in his adab al-mufti, his etiquette of the mufti, 
He said, فَقَدْ يَقُومُ الْمُفْتِي مَقَامَ النَّبِي Allah. I don't know how to translate that, Mawlana. But listen to what he said. He said that there are times when the mufti stands in the position of the prophets. What did he mean by that? Before we label him as something that he's not, because he was an incredible human being. The Sheikh of Imam Nawi. Abu Amr ibn Salah said that because the job of a prophet was to clarify religious guidance for the people and to relate on behalf of his Lord to people what cannot change. So sometimes people come to a mufti, they ask him a question, and he just says, Qala Allah, Qala Rasulullah. Allah said this, the Prophet said this. So he's like the Prophet. But a shatibi came almost 150 years after Abu Amr Salah. Abu Amr Salah lived in the 5th century. Shatibi in the 7th century. A Shatabi said 791 after Hijri, in the 8th century actually, in Andalus. He said, Bal qad yaqum maqam al-shari'. Allah. He said, no. There are also times where the mufti stands in the place of Allah. Now what did he mean by that before we declare Shatabi a deviant because we are so quick to do that and then we end up hurting ourselves. But check yourself before what? You wreck yourself. What he meant here is that there are issues for which there is no text. So he cannot function in a prophetic office because he's not able to relate anything from Quran and Sunnah to directly speak to that. For example, carbon emissions. You're not going to find in the Quran a verse about carbon emissions. You're not going to find in the Sunnah explicit text about carbon emissions. Or fair trade. You won't find that explicitly mentioned. So he says, here, the job of the mufti is to utilize, as a shafi'i said, فَقَدْ He said, النصوص محصورة منتهية A shafi'i said that the text of Qur'an and Sunnah are limited. But أفعال الإباد, the actions of people, are not limited. Thus, a shafi'i said, there has to be a way to deal with those unlimited actions implicitly relying on a system. And what he meant was usul, the system of the mufti. I'm sorry, but I felt that this had to be dropped because it's real deal. So when he says this, what he means is that the mufti is trained in a way for fatwa. Because the word fatwa means to clear something that's ambiguous. That's why we call young people what? In Surah Al-Kaf, innahum what? Fityatun. Because when you arrive at puberty, you become clear. Oh, we thought you was going to be ugly. Thank God. Mashallah. Mashallah. Whew. Your dua work, baby. Right? Had a whole fitya. Because then it becomes clear who he is, who she is. So the fatwa, also from the same word, means to make something clear, which there is gumud, something which is ambiguous to the Muslimin. That also is part of sirat al-mustaqim. And the reason that I'm touching on that is if the scholars said that there are two types of divine texts. One which we do not differ on its application, and that's the minority. And one, Zahir, which the scholars have differed from the beginning till now. Then don't you think we should have a little bit more, you know, compassion and a greater sense of acceptance when it comes to the opinions of scholars? Fatwa? And that's the rule. Because the scholar said, a chef, he said it well in Al-Um, that the fatwa is something that came from the minds of men based on sharia, and that we should allow each other to have depth and breadth and acceptance when fatwas come from people who were qualified. And I'll finish, and I'll give you this example. Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal. And his madhab, if you eat camel's meat, and you don't have that problem in Virginia, as far as I know, there aren't any camels local to Hardin, Virginia. Right? He said, if you eat camel's meat, you have to make wudu. Malik, rahimahullah, because his madhab was the soundest and the strongest and the most right, because it's from Medina, he said, sorry, he said, just joking, he said, no. People from Medina used to eat camel meat, they didn't make wudu. And these are the grandchildren of the Sahaba. So someone asked Imam Ahmed, because people like to make trouble, right? You know the troublemaker people? They like to ask questions. Oh yeah, what do you think about this? 
Ha 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 ha. Pow talk. They shouldn't call it a pow talk. They call it shaitan talk. Inna najwa min shaitan. Najwa is from shaitan. And any of those big scholars who like to talk about people, if they don't have the testicular fortitude to speak to them in their face, they're cowards. Say, so you can talk about Hamza Yusuf all you want in your closet. Go to the man's face and say, you know what? I think you're Ahlul Bidah. Go to Yasa Qadi. You so, you so hard, you know, about Yasa Qadi all day long. Go, to the, go down to Memphis, Tennessee, because they got them country fellas, swamp people. Go to Sheikh Yasser and say, you know what? I think you're wrong. Then I'll respect you. But for you to get a group of little teenage kids who live in the suburbs and got nice IMAX, and their mom and daddy's got them full Skype with a credit card, and they're able to sit there and listen to you all night long, oh, you're just a really big, bad, brave man. And you don't even let people put comments on your YouTube page, you're so scared. Milkshake. Yeah. And it, you know what's scary about that person? Has absolutely no training in the dean. And if he's here, I'd say it to his face, because I'm 6'5", and I got these fly shoes on. And secondly, and secondly, I will say this. The scary thing is you compare that to the number of people who go to Tafsir Quran by Nu'man Ali Khan. You'll find 20,000 people went to Tafsir and 250,000 people went to listen to this man slander other people. What is wrong with our ummah? What is wrong with our ummah? That we are gathered around fitan instead of being gathered to the good. We know what flies like to gather around so we understand maybe what our spiritual states are like. Whereas when I converted to Islam, I used to drive an hour every day to memorize Quran with a sheikh in an hour home. And I had time for none of that fitness stuff, man. You could take that to the curb, B. Because I want to memorize the book of Allah. And he used to tell me, if your heart is filled with the fitna around you, you cannot fill it with the nur of the Quran. 